Now, welcome to our Brookline Booksmith author event series. Today we are featuring the wonderful authors Kate Hartfield for her book, The Valkyrie, and the delightful Marie Brennan for her book, The Waking of Agnantir. Hopefully I'm saying this correctly. Uh, my name is Jessica Young. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a bookseller here at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you are familiar with our store, welcome back. If it is your first time that you're hearing about us, welcome. Thank you for being part of our community today and for making us your independent bookstore with your attendance and your book purchases. Unfortunately, just so you know, The Waking of Enganter is not actually available for purchase uh, in the United States through us. And so I am dropping a link into the chat uh, from ForbiddenPlanet.com so you can use that to purchase this book as well. Uh, the first celebrated author this evening is Kate Hartfield, an author, teacher, editor in Ottawa, Canada. She grew up mainly in the Northern Ontario and Manitoba and spent a year in Belize as a teenager. She graduated from the political science program at the University of Ottawa in 1999 and received her master's degree in journalism from Carleton University. Her journalistic work has appeared in several publications and she was a member of the editorial board of the Ottawa Citizen, the Daily Broadsheet in Canada's Capital, and she wrote a regular column on politics and social affairs, wrote and edited editorials, and acquired and edited opinion pieces for the newspaper. She was the editorial pages editor, the masthead position for two years before she left the newspaper in 2015. That was the year she was a finalist of the National Newspaper Award in Editorial Writing. Her novel, The Embroidered Book, which is a historical fantasy about Marie Antoinette and her sister Maria Carolina, came out in spring 2022 from Harper Voyager and was in the Sunday Times, Globe and Mail and Toronto Star bestseller lists. Her novel that we're celebrating tonight, The Valkyrie, is a retelling of Norse and Germanic legends, um, was published this past March, and the it is currently the embroidered book shortlist for the Aurora, Aurora Award for Best Novel. Uh, also, in 2018, Kate published the time-traveling novella Alice Payne Arrives and the interactive novel The Road to Canterbury. Both were finalists for the Nebula Awards, and the second Alice Payne book, which is Alice Payne Rides, um, was shortlisted for the Aurora Awards with the first one as well, and um, the game, her second game for the choice of games, uh, the Magician's Workshop was published in December 2019, and it was shortlisted for a Nebula Award. Kate now lives in Ottawa, Canada, with her partner and son, and teaches journalism at Carleton University Creative Writing Online for the Loft Literary Center, and works as a freelance writer and editor. And the other speaker that we have this evening is the magnificent Marie Brennan. She holds an undergraduate degree in archaeology and folklore from Harvard University and pursued graduate studies in cultural and anthropology and folklore at Indi Indiana University before leaving to write full time. From her first series, the doppelganger duology of warrior and witch through the Onyx Court series to the acclaimed pseudo Victorian memoirs of Lady Trent, Marie has drawn readers into a variety of beautiful worlds. From this incredible Lady Trent series, uh, Natural History of Dragons was a finalist for World Fantasy Award and won the Prix Intermaginalis in France for the best translated novel. The final book, Within the Sanctuary of Wings, won the RT Reviewer's Choice Award and best fantasy novel. The series as a whole was a finalist for both Hugo Awards and the Grand Prix Imaginaire. She also has a fondness for role-playing games, which have led her to write both fiction and setting inspir inspirations for several game lines, including Tiny D6 and Legends of Five Rings. And a resurgence of her academic work led to Viking re revenge epics like The Waking of Antigir uh, that we are celebrating tonight. And together with fellow author Alec Helms as M.A. Carrick, she is the author of Rook and Rose epic fantasy trilogy beginning with The Mask of Admirers. She has taught creative writing to both college students and 12 year olds and has run a number of workshops on topics ranging from world building to fight scenes to how to perform public readings. When not writing or playing RPGs, she practices photography and karate and she lives with her husband in the San Francisco Bay Area. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the wonderful authors Marie Brennan and Kate Hartfield and I hope y'all are just as excited as I am. Thank you guys for being here. We're so happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Marie and I have been planning this for months, and uh, we've known each other for some time now, some years, and uh, yeah. we share um, a real nerdy love of uh, history and 
uh, retellings and, uh, you know, and research. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, the, the sheer depths of historical research nerdery that the two of us can both sink to are substantial. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Yeah, definitely. So we'll probably get there before the end of the hour. Um, yeah, so um, just to echo what Jessica said, if you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We'll have some time at the end for that and uh, feel free to use the chat as well. Um, Marie, do you want to start with uh, what your book's about and and uh, how you came to it? Uh, sure. So The Viking of Angantyr is, uh, it, it's my Viking revenge epic. Um, it is, uh, it's a standalone novel, unlike most of what I've written. So this is not the start of a series. It is complete in and of itself. And it is the tale of a bondsmaid named Herbor who has been haunted all her life by the voices of ghosts. And when the haunting starts getting worse in ways that she fears threatens her sanity, uh, she goes on a quest to figure out how to shut them up. And in the course of it, uncovers a great deal more than just ghosts are amiss at the moment. I, I refer to this as the bastard child of my senior thesis, uh, because when I was in college, I did in fact write my thesis on uh, weapons in Viking Age Scandinavia. And in the course of that, I studied the Old Norse language for a semester. I read a bunch of the sagas and so forth. And in a couple of different locations, I came across this poem called The Waking of Angantyr, which is a dialogue between a young woman named Hervor and a ghost named Angantyr, where she's basically saying, give me your sword. And he's saying, the sword is cursed. You don't want it. And she says, screw that. I want it anyway. Uh, it's, it's this great, like, intense little poem. And I found out from one of the places where I saw it that it was part of a larger saga. I was like, cool, I have got to go read this saga. It is not one of the better known sagas. Turns out that's for a reason. The saga it's contained in, frankly, it is actually four unrelated texts in a trench coat, okay? Like, it is not even a coherent story. It is a bunch of things that, like, a professor of Old Norse has said to me, yeah, these things were probably completely separate, and then somebody smushed them together into one book. Uh, and so I went and I read it, and you you start off with, as you do in a lot of these traditional texts, it's like, and here is the story of a couple of generations ago, and all of these things that happened, which then led to these things happening, which then led to, okay, here's Hervor, and she goes around as a cross-dressing Viking for a while, like you do, and then you go and you have the confrontation with the ghost, and she gets the sword, and a page and a half later she goes home, and that's the last you hear of her which was frustrating because the things I'd encountered said she wanted the sword in order to get revenge. And then I got to the saga and I'm like, she can't get revenge because of the two guys who are responsible for the thing that she's trying to avenge. One died of his wounds immediately after that fight. And the other one has his own saga to go die in for unrelated reasons. Uh, and so literally it's like a page and a half after she gets the sword, she goes home and she's done. And it moves on to her son and then to his kid. And it's, you know, continuing onward with your four unrelated texts in a trench coat. And I was so disappointed. Like, I was promised this bloody tale of revenge and I did not get it. So clearly I had to write it. Uh, Kate, I, I have to say, I noticed with yours that you were working with different variant texts and so forth. And so how did you decide that you were going to, like, crossbreed all of these together and cherry pick which bits from which ones were going to go into your version. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was a challenge for me. I was just thinking about, you know, when you were talking about uh, different versions of the tale, probably having been smushed together at some point, which might explain some of the incoherence, you know, and uh, in my case, um, there was a lot of that. And so a lot of the old stories that I was looking at, for example, had historical figures such as um, Attila the Hun and King Theodoric in the same at the same time and place, right? Which can't couldn't have happened historically. So um, a lot of these tales were historical fiction at the time uh, that they were uh, written down in the forms that that have come down to us, uh, which is about a thousand years ago in my case. Um, but uh, but they probably had been mashed together, and these were campfire tales that had you know sort of coalesced and converged and then diverged and come back together. Um, so yeah, the the forms that I used to write the Valkyrie, uh, there's sort of two clumps um, of forms of the story, uh, the Germanic clump and the Norris clump. Uh, so the Nibelungen lead, which is um, the great tale of Siegfried, which inspired Wagner's operas um, and uh, many other things, and uh, sort of came down to uh, 
to modern fantasy through Tolkien is the Germanic side uh, of the story. And there are also a whole bunch of other uh, late medieval manuscripts, um, like the Rose Garden of Worms, for example, um, and a whole bunch of other sort of associated tales that have to do with this kingdom on the Rhine at the end of, you know, I say end in quotation marks, but the, the sort of crumbling of the Roman Empire in the fifth century common era when Attila was making his move on, uh, on Western Europe. Uh, and then there are also these Norse versions of the same stories uh, because, you know, people moved around. Uh, so um, in those versions, those versions are mainly in the prose edda and the poetic edda, and particularly in a saga called the Volsenga saga, which is often translated as the Song of the Volsungs. So yeah, a challenge for me was that I had to decide which of those elements I wanted to, um, to use in my story, uh, which was sometimes frustrating, but also it was... Um, you know, it was a little bit empowering as well, because I could say, well, for the story that I want to tell, this element will be most useful, or this element will be most useful, or I'll, I'll make a little mention here. Here's, here will be an Easter egg for people who know the stories. Yeah. Other people will just think it's part of the plot, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's always fun as well. Uh, but like you, I was really, it came from this place of dissatisfaction in a way. It wasn't, not that the tales were coherent or incoherent for me, but or that they were not, you know, that they were missing the most exciting bit. It wasn't that sort of dissatisfaction, but it was a sense that the the two main female characters, um, I just knew, I just knew that if they could tell their version, it would not be what has come down to us. That that their version just didn't make sense. It was incoherent in a psychological sense. Like their the way that they acted, the way they made decisions are just not things that people would do. Um, and they made sense from an external perspective that I could see how men might think this is why they were doing things. But yeah. Nobody would, nobody would, <laughs> would actually behave that way. So I thought, well, what's the story behind the story? Yeah, your comment about Easter eggs, I definitely have a few of those in there to the point where I, I sort of apologize in advance for the like two readers I might have in the lifetime of this book who speak enough Old Norse to spot the plot spoilers I stuck in some of the names. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wrote the original draft of this um, at this point about 20 years ago. I actually wrote it not long after I finished college. And then I wrote it right before I got an agent and started selling a, a novel that I had written earlier. And so this basically just kind of went on the shelf more or less immediately. Uh, and I didn't dust it off until in like 2020 or thereabouts. I went back to read it going, yeah, there was that book that I never did anything with. And I went and read it and thought, well, there's some things that I would change now. Um, but on the whole, this doesn't suck. Let me do something with it. And so there are things in there that I'm like, yeah, I wrote this right after I was studying Old Norse. And so a couple of the names that I invented for it, because some of the names are from the saga and some of them are not. And so I'm like, yeah, there's technically plot spoilers in there, but only if you speak Old Norse. So, you know, that's going to be like three <laughs> people. <laughs> exactly. And if you speak Old Norse, then, you know, you might be, you're coming to it with a different, uh, you know, with different right. needs in any way, right? You know? Exactly, yeah. Um, but like what I said about the character who has his own saga to go guy in, I just have to relate this for kind of that, like, don't expect the sagas to have satisfying modern fiction qualities in a lot of places, because in Orvar Oder's saga, um, he basically gets a prophecy that his horse Foxy is going to kill him. And you go along through the saga and eventually his horse dies. And when you get to the end of the saga, at one point, Orvar Oder trips over the skull of his dead horse, and a poisonous snake comes out of the skull and bites him, and he dies. The end. He's the protagonist of the saga. That's how he goes out. And so, you know, I don't think it's a spoiler since, uh, you know, he's one of the people that is uh, being targeted in this book. I decided that the Cursed Sword, I gave it a fake etymology that its name translates to Serpent's Tooth, as my, like, you know, wink and a nod toward the stupid snake in the skull, which... It's just so unsatisfying again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really like the way that The Waking of Egg and Tear, it, it deals with that question of fate because I find that is one of the frustrating things retelling Norse stories in particular is that um, the concept of fate or destiny yeah. um, is very strong and also very alien, I yeah. think, for most of us today. Um, you know, like, why would you why would you go through all these things if you knew what was going to happen? Or you, hi, Minerva. <laughs> um, you know, so as a storyteller, how did you wrestle with that in, in this book? That's actually one of the things I found myself putting more to the forefront when I revised the book, when I was, you know, dusting it off to, to send around. Um, 
because yeah, that that was something I was thinking about quite a bit. Uh, you're right that it crops up in the sagas. In Yell Saga, there's a bit where this old woman basically says, "You should move that pile of wood that's resting by the side of Yell's hall because that's the pile of wood that's going to be used to burn him and all of his kin." And then there's literally a line of like, and then they just never got around to moving it. Like <laughs> she told you. And still, nobody manages to move the pile of wood. <laughs> it's just so fatalistic in some ways. Uh, and so that was a thing that I, I decided to look at more of kind of the idea that the more you involve yourself with the divine and with, you know, these like higher powers, basically, like if you want its help, you are also subjecting yourself to the fate that it brings. That, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a trade off there that you can go along without divine help and also not be bound by fate. But if you want the help, then you're bound. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to take away from the agency of the person. I think right. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's a very delicate and interesting thing. Um, yeah, and that, you know another similarity between your book and mine is uh, you know that we are both telling the stories of women, and mm -hmm. uh, you know that was something as I mentioned that I found really dissatisfying. So in the Valkyrie, the two main characters are Brunhild, who is the titular Valkyrie, and she is um, sort of an amalgam. She appears in different versions of the tale as sometimes she's a, a Valkyrie who's, who's been exiled um, because she disagreed with Odin, disobeyed his instructions. Um, and sometimes she's a sorceress and sometimes she's a queen over the water. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my version is sort of all of those things put together. And I kind of had fun with the puzzle of how can I how can I take the bits that I liked the most from all of the different versions and make them cohere? So uh, I did that a lot with her. And then the other uh, main female character is Gudrun, who is also sometimes Kriemhild in the Germanic versions. Uh, and uh, she is a princess of the Burgundian kingdom on the Rhine. Um, and it's a little bit confusing because it's not Burgundy. Um, the Burgundian yeah. kingdom at the time um, was the pe made up of the people that later moved to Burgundy, what is now Burgundy in France, uh, because yeah. of the events of the story. Actually, they were under attack and they had to move to what is now France. Um, and Gudrun is, uh, she is, uh, you know, a princess and quite clever and um, has a, a witch for a mother, um, which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. Uh, <laughs> and in my version, she... Uh, you know, she and um, and Brunhild are in love and they're telling each other their stories about how they got to where they are. And that part of it actually came to me, the idea of them being in love came to me when I was reading Margaret Armour's translation of the Nibelungen lead, which is the same translation that Tolkien used. Mm. And there were these lines that kept popping out to me, like about how when they saw each other across the hall, they couldn't take their eyes off each other. And you know, they, they, when they greeted each other, they kissed each other warmly, or they kept blushing when they yeah. looked at each other. And, you know, I'm sure that it was meant in a different way. Yeah. Both by but the translator. Go, I ship it. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so, and I think that that, like that allowed me to ask questions about um, the sort of simplistic way that, that many of the versions I had read portrayed these women is that, that they're supposed to be quite jealous of each other. And this jealousy is what eventually drives this catastrophe is that they just they're bragging about whose husband is better and this sort of causes the downfall of a kingdom and i thought well there might be something else behind that yeah yeah gender in these sources is weird because like it's i actually read something for my senior thesis that effectively argued for um the mentality at least in the, the norse world this wouldn't necessarily have applied to germany um or like the germanic areas I, uh, but that it was just fundamentally a different concept of gender than the one we work with now, because we're sort of, obviously, you know, modern ideas about gender are a bit different, but we are the inheritors of an idea of men are this thing and women are this thing and they are different things. And uh, there was an article by Carol, Carol Clover that was arguing, I think, pretty persuasively for a model that you see elsewhere, where effectively there's, here's what men are, and then like women are basically defective men rather than being a separate thing. But it leads to this spectrum where um, there's sort of like an admired mode of behavior and you get some stories where the women are admired when they move toward that masculine mode, which is why that you can get some of these like, you know, Valkyries and other things where uh, you have female characters acting in a more kind of stereotypically masculine fashion. But it also means that like, 
wow, were the Vikings homophobic because for men to slip away from that end of the spectrum was extremely bad. Like if I remember correctly, and I'm not going to be able to tell you like what time period and where in the Norse world this was, but a woman could divorce her husband for wearing a shirt that was too effeminate. Like Mm -hmm. that's the level of kind of anxiety that there was around this, but it's why you get things admittedly, um, Hervara Saga, which is one of the names for the, the saga that the Waking of Angantyr is in, uh, and kind of like Volsunga Saga, they both fall into the more legendary rather than historical classification of these things. Uh, and so they have much more of that leeway of you get these women who, like I said, Hervor goes around as a cross-dressing Viking for a while. She calls herself Hervard. Um, and, you know, you don't get as much of that in the historical ones. But it is really a one-way street of it's okay for women to go toward the masculine end, but men going toward the feminine end, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've seen some uh, research, and you know, I'm <clears throat> I'm not a historian by training, so um, this is just what I've read, and you would probably be able to correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I've seen some research about the fact that the um, you know what would be read today as homophobic slurs. Um, are even a little bit more specific as being sort of the passive partner, right? That yes, <laughs> that it's all about yes. it's all about basically um, a sort of top bottom relationship. And uh, I actually tried to include some of that in the book, and I was like, it would take me so long to explain what I mean by this that I had to kind of move on um, yeah. because to translate that for a modern audience, it's like it's similar in some ways the way that gender and sex is used, you know, um, especially against men. Yeah, uh, but but not the same, not the same as today. Yeah, you see that actually in the the classical world as well, like the Romans and the Greeks. Um, like there, there's a sense in which you can look at a lot of wealthy elite Roman men, and like we would say, oh look, they're bisexual, and that is just so irrelevant to the way that they thought about sex at all. The important thing for a male Roman citizen was that whatever was going on, you were the active partner. Didn't matter who you were doing it with. That part was, you know, whatever you do, what you like as long as you're the active one. The minute you're the passive partner, you are a pervert and, you know, like completely uh, reviled and so forth. So yes, their conception of all of that was very, very different from what we tend to think of in the modern day. Uh, And yeah, the Vikings, which is, you get a lot of stuff with sort of modern ideas about Vikings that really lean into a lot of that homophobic hyper masculinity that can get very toxic. That's actually one of the other things I changed when I revised the book. There's still homophobia in the setting, but in the version that I wrote, you know, right after college, um, I had Hervor like making some homophobic insults at various points. And I looked at that and went, I don't need that in here. Like, I feel that the society, I'm not going to change it. So they're like, yeah, we don't care, you know, sleep with who you like, because that felt out of place to me. But I was like, I don't need my protagonist to be like buying into that, even though it is her culture and she probably would think that way. That felt like just sort of a degree of uh, leaning into the setting further than I needed to go. Yeah, that's always an interesting <clears throat> question is, uh, you know, like, I think it's it's completely fair to say at some point, okay, well, this is even though I'm setting this in history, and even though yeah. one of the reasons I'm doing this is that I adore history and I think it's fascinating, also at the end of the day, it's a story. <clears throat> it's a story for today, and it's it's in many ways about today because that's what we do is we we sort of look at our world through stories. Yeah. Um. So you know, in in the Valkyrie, um, there's a, a gay male partnership, uh, mm-hmm. of quite important secondary characters, and it was the same thing. There is some, you know, there is a little bit of kind of prejudice around the edges and people making comments and that kind of thing but for the most part it's not a big deal yeah. um, which I think it's also not it's not entirely anachronistic but it's also not something you're going to be able to portray or at least that I didn't want to portray in a sort of yeah. perfectly analogous here's what would it be like in fifth century um Ryan the Ryan area um I wanted it to work for this story and um yeah so there is I think always a tension there between uh, yeah. who you're talking to and the stories that you're retelling Yeah, and I mean, you were working in actual history, you know, obviously kind of like carefully massaging what was going on when and what do we know about it. For mine, because I had chosen to set it in a Norse flavored but secondary world, it's not our actual history, it's not the Norse gods who are showing up. Um, For me, there was more a question of like tone and fidelity to the, uh, the culture that was inspiring it because like nothing else in this story is like nice and accepting so you know it really felt like it would be out of place if I had it be like queer friendly but also they have slaves and everybody's getting murdered (laughs) you know it was 
tonally, it felt like that was just not the place to be doing that. But it still matters that, again, yeah, in my book, like, there are people who are gay. There are some references that make it clear that it's not like this doesn't exist. It's that society has problems around it. And, well, the society's kind of screwed up in many other respects. So, um, you know, and it's something where if I were writing it now, I don't know if I would build it differently from the ground up because uh, I was working with something where it was something much older. And I'm not usually the kind of author who completely throws out a draft and starts over. I was revising the text I already had. And that probably did constrain to some extent how far I felt like I could take it away from what I had initially written, just because my brain doesn't necessarily have the same elasticity around a story that's been around for that long. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it, like, certainly I think that in general, the uh, the depiction of a lot of the things in society, just because an author puts something into their book doesn't mean they endorse it. Sometimes it's there to show you that this is, you know, not great. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about that question of where exactly to set it, because mm -hmm. that is a, a place where we diverged a little bit, because I decided yeah. to set mine in real history, uh, which caused some problems. I mean, it's it's. <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit of a, an alternate history in a sense, because obviously, well, I say obviously, I don't know, but I can assume that Fafnir, the dragon or Lindworm in, in my version, did not actually appear alongside Attila the Hunt. Look, um, the historical record is very incomplete and patchy. Exactly. We can't prove he wasn't there. <laughs> exactly. It could have happened for sure. Um, but it, I think it is, I decided to set it in real history. Um, but telling that history the way that the stories have actually come down to us, which include mm -hmm. things like dragons and magic rings as part of yeah. history, because historical fiction and speculative fiction were not distinct until recently. Um, so I, I just was faithful to the sources that tell us this is what happened, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was a challenge in some ways to set it in real history, but also because the particular sagas I was telling were very grounded in this is how this kingdom was destroyed. This is how Attila was successful. This is the story of how that happened. I felt mm -hmm. like taking it out of that context, um, you know, and just, I could have, because Attila is in the sagas uh, and in the Nibelungen lead, he's called different things like uh, Etzel or Etli yeah. or Atli. Um, so I could have just used those names and thought most readers are not going to get who this is. Um, but in the end, I decided, okay, no, I want to try and uh, retell it as historical fiction. Um, so what made you decide to go the other way? Honestly, to the best of my recollection, I don't think it occurred to me to write it as historical fiction. Uh, at the time that I originally drafted it, I hadn't ever written historical fiction, though I've done a bunch of it now. But that was something I didn't start doing until a couple of years later. And I think, like I said, Hervador Saga is firmly in that more legendary saga end of things, especially the parts of it that are around the waking of Angantyr, where it is much more fantastical. And it's kind of like... Um, you know, you're saying with the, the different sources you were drawing on, I my impression is that the more Germanic sources tend to have a more sort of historical flavor, whereas Volsunga Saga and like the Poetic Edda are much more off in the legendary direction. So since I was working with something that didn't really interface much with real history uh, until like kind of toward the very end of the saga, it does that. But at that point, you're also a couple of generations after Hervor into things that I was not going to be including. And so it felt like I was already being handed kind of a fantasy story. And the only thing connecting it to the real world was reference to, you know, real world gods. Uh, and by choosing to set it in a secondary world and chuck the mythology, make up my own sort of Norse feeling kind of uh, set of gods and myths and so forth, um, you know, it, it just, it felt like it gave me more room to be making up all the surrounding context that I needed to supply for, the, the poem basically forms the centerpiece of the novel, like the events that happen there are at the middle of the novel, and I was building everything to either side of it. So there was much more inventing out of whole cloth, uh, and I think that just made me default to secondary world, especially because I hadn't actually done historical at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's really interesting to me how there's this sort of this fuzzy territory between secondary world and, and, and historical. And I think that it yeah. it does lend itself to these sorts of retellings in an interesting way. I was thinking about how in films recently, we see this a lot, especially there's a couple of A24 films. Um, there's Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and or yeah. it's actually just called The Green Knight and um the northman is that what it's called i think it's called the northman uh yes and i haven't seen that one yet but i'm yeah, I actually yeah really it's, want to see it. it's really good i liked it it's the story of amleth which is you know the precursor to hamlet and um and it's really interesting because you know it's it's 
it's in history, but it's also got that feeling of it's it's not really, you know, it's, yeah. it's unfamiliar. It could be kind yeah. of anywhere. It's, it's storyland, you know, yeah. um, which I think sort of fits. Yeah. yeah. Well, like you said, a lot of our sources, even in the historical sagas, it's not like these are, you know, historical documents of a, a type that we would consider to be factual per se. They're just less inclined, not even completely uninclined, less inclined to have fantastical shit happening in them. Uh, yeah. You know, there's going to be a little bit less of the dragons and magic rings showing up in the historical sagas. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there anything else? I'm just looking at our list. Is there anything else about like research that um, you want to talk this about? This is one where, in a way, I, I had to do very little research at all because I wrote it immediately after researching my thesis. <laughs> so like, right. I, I had been there, I had done that. Uh, yeah, I read a ton of the sagas. Um, I, I, I had taken a semester of Old Norse, I had taken a class on the Vikings, uh, done, you know, additional reading for the thesis. And so I had already kind of marinated in a lot of that. And the few things that I did have to go research, it was like, um, the the stuff that I had read and done hadn't really been focused a lot on Viking ships. So, for example, you know, Herbo spends a while on board a, a long ship. And I did have to go, like, look up, all right, how were those constructed? How did people, like, live on and operate on them? Um, and oddly, because I, I was checking some of those details when I was revising the novel for publication, and I realized just the difference between, like, 2003 me and 2023 me, um, I hadn't gone into that much detail when I was writing it initially. I just kind of went, yeah, I know what a long ship looks like. We're good. And then I came back and went, oh, no, that's not right. I need to look up more here because I've gotten much more finicky. Um, basically, The Watershed was me writing the Onyx Court novels, which I call my home PhD in English history. Uh, before I wrote those, I would do some research. After I wrote those, ooh, let me go read things. <laughs> you know, I got a lot more rabid about that. <laughs> I can see that for sure. I, I'm just wondering with you, because I mean, it's not hard to know that like Volsunga Saga and the Nibelungen lead are versions of the same story, but like the Rose Garden of Herms, I'd never heard of. And so how did you know, like, what was it that in the researching you found these other texts or did you already know about them? Yeah, I found them. I, I sort of one thing led to another, uh, you know, so um, yeah, it started out uh, just with reading modern versions of, mm -hmm. uh, of the Norse myths. So my kid was eight. I think at the seven or eight at the time when when this idea first came to me and uh, we were reading you know Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology book and mm -hmm. several other Norse mythology books that were um, appropriate for an eight year old um, and uh, we were and I came across the story of Brunhild which I knew already um, but as I was telling it to him it sort of it it, it jarred for me that I said I felt okay well there's something there's something behind this story. Uh, so yeah, so once I, that's where it started and I just, I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna go read the original. And, and I'm like, oh, there's not an original. There are many originals. And and yeah. uh, so that led me from one thing to another thing to another thing. And and often it was just a case of then, you know, I'd find uh, an academic article or something about it and mm -hmm. that would mention another source and uh, and I'd go read that. So it is often a sort of trail of breadcrumbs leading from one yeah. thing to the next. Um, but for me, it was, um, you know, th those primary sources of the stories themselves was pretty easy to research because even though there are several of them, you, it is a finite number. You know, you read a half dozen things and you have a sense of the the scope of what the stories, the, the ones yeah. that are extant anyway. Yeah. Um, but then it was the, like you say, the, the, the physical details of the reality that you're constructing, whether it's historical or secondary world, that often takes a different kind of research. And um, for me also the, the Burgundian kingdom um, is not something there's a lot of popular history about. I was gonna say, yeah, that, that kind of period of late antiquity into early medieval is a very poorly known area, just in, in the general consciousness, at least, and I think not terribly well documented historically either. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, something that I had to really, I had to get those, you know, those $200 books that, you know, published by academics that they, you know, <laughs> that they were, wish were not $200, but nobody is ever going to read them. Um, and you, you go looking for a used copy, and you're like, well, here's one that's only yeah. 150. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, I mean, there, obviously there is research being done uh, on that period, but it isn't, it isn't something that has seeped into the popular yeah. uh, historical, you know, popular nonfiction very much. Um, but there are things there, there are even translations of, uh, for example, the legal code, um, mm -hmm. 
of the the Burgundian kingdom uh, that was established right after this happened. Um, and that's been translated. So I could actually read the legal code and, and find out things like, well, what was the law of marriage? You know, what was the law of inheritance? Yeah. Um, and just little facts of daily life that, that would be in that code um, just sort of incidentally. So there were things like that that were just uh, a gold mine. Um, and even things like, uh, you know, what language did they speak? Because their language has not survived um, yeah. beyond a few words. And and so to, trying to decide, uh, you probably remember, I was uh, agonizing on a, a forum we're both on about what to even call the Burgundians because Burgundian is not what they would have called themselves, you know? So, yeah. uh, you know, do I use Latin? Do I use something else? Um, so yeah, it was a lot of that kind of thing that that uh, pulled me down many different rabbit holes. I'm curious what the, the different versions that you're reading. Have you ever read Diana Wynne-Jones' Eight Days of Luke? I haven't. I love Diana Wynne-Jones, but I haven't read that one. Oh, that, that was actually my introduction to Norse mythology. And it's the reason why I can never actually believe in Loki as being malicious, like ever, <laughs> because I got introduced to him through Eight Days of Luke. Uh, and, you know, he just, it was, you know, a joke that went wrong. <laughs> Like, don't ask me yeah. questions. But there is actually a brief sort of, uh, not not like a, a, there's a cameo appearance effectively from like Sigurd and Brynhild there. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was also my first introduction to that story. Um, nice. And actually nice. there's a, an image in there which gets echoed in the waking of Angantyr. Um, it, it's specifically the idea of Brynhild asleep in the flames. Um, I, I kind of have that a bit with uh, a Barrow scene that I have in my book without, you know, giving spoilers, uh, that that was what was in my head. And I came to that image through that novel. So it's a fun one and a quick read. All right. I'm definitely going to read it because I, I really like her other books that I've read. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else we wanted to get to before we open it up to questions? And I'm going to glass real quick. We, we sort of pre-gamed you and people might know of sending each other things of like, what else could we be talking about here? Um, yeah. Oh, well, there is favorite bits. Um, yeah. I. Yeah, well, with the, the favorite bits of, like, stuff that we took from the sources, I think I, I already mentioned my, you know, fake etymology for Tyrfing, the uh, the cursed sword, because, like, the whole bit with the horse's skull and the snake that comes out, you know, I, I just, I gotta get that in there somewhere. Um, at this point, it's a little sad because I know there are other bits and pieces I put in there, but I put them in there 20 years ago. And so it's long enough that, honestly, I just have a vague recollection of, yeah, there were other nods I made. I don't remember what they were. <laughs> How about you? What are your favorite bits that you kind of yoinked? You mentioned some Easter eggs. Like, what are some of them? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, there are a lot of things like um, uh, oh, their names, you know, they're, the facts that uh, several of the characters uh, have names of figures that appear in other stories or in these stories, but I couldn't really use them the way that they were written. So I've just, they're Easter eggs for people who know, um, you know, uh, who these people are, then they'll show up and they'll say, oh, okay, I recognize that name or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there are even some characters that change names along the way um, to sort of account for the many different versions yeah. of the story. So that was fun. Um, and, and there were just little, there are parts that when I was reading the originals, I thought, okay, well, that's got to go in, that's got to go in. You know, like these are my tent poles I've got to have in the story. Um, and, you know, everything else around it can be flexible. But, you know, there is one, there's one poem called uh, The Hell Ride of Brunhild, which is when Brunhild yeah. goes down into hell, basically, uh, uh, after the death of Sigurd, no spoilers. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, if you have, if you have a poem called The Hell Ride of Brunhild, like, you know, that's got to go in somehow, right? Yeah, you've you got to use that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so how exactly that happens and why and everything else, I felt, okay, well, I'm going to have my own version of yeah. exactly what that looks like and, and, um, you know, not just retell it exactly how it is uh, in, I think it's in the Poetic Edda. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to just, uh, you know, retell it, but it has to be there. And, and there were a lot of things like that that were just so cool, you know, like there is magic beer. And I thought, well, magic beer has got to be in there somewhere because um, if there's a version of a story with magic beer, then um, who's not going to use that? Um, so yeah. I, I think it was a lot of that, just sort of, sort of neat little bits and pieces uh, that I felt I could change other things. You know, they're sort of the, um, the sinews of the story uh, that made it into a plot. I felt I could I could do that myself, you know, I could make that, you know, you know, because as we've been saying, sort of adapting these stories to um, fit the way stories work today, 
um, requires a little bit of that. Um, but then along the way, there were these moments where I thought, well, I've got to hit that. I've got to hit that. I've got yeah. to hit that. Yeah, I think for me, the the I've got to hit it um, was probably the the home ganga, which is, you know, a, a form of dueling. Um, and the version that I have in my story isn't necessarily exactly how the home ganga worked in Norse society. But like, that was just one of those, we've got to have this. We've got to have people doing this dueling thing. Uh, just because, I don't know, I like weapons. I like fight scenes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, we do have one question from somebody saying, uh, any favorite Norse myth inspired stories besides Eight Days of Luke, which was also a favorite of mine as a kid. So the horrible thing is the minute anybody asks me any favorites that fit X criteria, my brain immediately jettisons all memory of everything I've ever read. Uh, yes. So I'm hoping you have some thoughts, Kate. No, I am blanking too, which is bizarre because I know, yeah, there's got to be, um, um, I'm trying to think of what, you know, it's not exactly Norse, but I think um, some of the uh, the stories that I read when I was a kid that definitely influenced my desire to write this kind of story um, is probably uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe, you know, mm. and so her her stories about, um, you know, Roman Britain and, and post-Roman Britain uh, and the sort of working in of legends into real history uh definitely when I was a kid and I, I found Rosemary Sutcliffe's books uh on the shelves at the Winnipeg Public Library and took them home uh that to me was uh was really inspiring and uh and I think sort of cemented the idea for me too that there is this fuzzy area between history and and myth uh mm -hmm. that that is true in a different way um so that and, and the Arthurian legends I'm trying to think of there's, uh, as soon as we as soon as we finish this call we're both going to think of about six different yeah. norse uh <laughs> norse inspired stories um, though i think i haven't read that many norse flavored things especially in recent years i think because there is kind of that like subset out there who really like to run with the toxic masculinity and like unabashed racism kind of corner of Norse fandom, if I can call it a fandom, uh, you know, just like the, much like Sparta, there's kind of this popular consciousness version of them that likes to lean into some of the worst aspects and magnify them like beyond the historical reality and hold them up as good. Uh, and so I think there's a part of me that's leery when I see Norse stuff that isn't coming from somebody like Neil Gaiman, who I trust not to be doing the toxic masculinity version of it. Um, yeah, if I see something, I'm just like, mm, I don't know. Are you going to be the kind of grimdark rape fest sort of thing where I just, I, I don't want to be reading mm -hmm. that. Um, and it's not that all the books are like that. I just wind up being, you know, a little leery and, and leaning away from reading stuff because I'm worried about what version of it I'm going to get. Um, I know that there are things I've read that aren't that, but yeah, all going straight out of my head. Oh, I know. It's just amazing. But finally, the obvious one obvious choice has popped into my head, uh, which is uh, my friend Chadwick, Chadwick Ginther's books, especially the Thunder Road trilogy. Um, and I'll put that in the chat in a minute. But um, he's a Manitoba author. And uh, I grew up in Manitoba as well. And there's this huge Icelandic community in Manitoba. I grew up not far from the town of Gimli, uh, which is, as you might expect, Icelandic. Yeah. Uh, and so Chadwick has these stories that are um, the Norse gods set in Manitoba, um, in like in, in modern day, um, and they're really fantastically written and work in all of these things, and, and they have this deep, deep love of, of the original sources in them. Um, so I'll put that in the chat in a minute. Um, there's also a great short story by Vajra Chandrasekhar. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Excuse my typing while I look up the name of the story. <laughs> Yes, we have to lean on our auxiliary brains here. Yes, I might. Uh, oh, it's yeah, it's in Grievous Angel. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to put it in chat because I can't. I can't remember how to pronounce this. So, but you can look it up. Um, Marie can pronounce it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to actually. That's the wrong. Hey, there you, you know, go. The dude, what is gnawing on the the roots of the tree? Yes, exactly. So Actually, yeah, the, so, uh, Vajra, Vajra Chandra Sekera is his name, um, and he's got a wonderful novel out, okay. uh, which is not Norse-inspired, called The Saint of Bright Doors, but this is a short story that is Norse-inspired, and it's fantastic. And Chadwick Ginther is the other author I mentioned. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the Nidhogger, the first element of that, reminded me of the other thing that I was like, oh, I'm totally going to stick this in the book. Um, I... 
I think I just call it a stake of scorn rather than throwing the Icelandic word at you, but the, the nidstang, which is a like form of cursing somebody where you chop the head off of a horse and you put it on a stick as a, a method of cursing somebody. And what I love about this is that I found out in, I want to say it was the early aughts, there was a stretch of time where Iceland, there were a bunch of protests against their prime minister. And apparently during these protests, Icelanders were taking the heads of cod and putting them on sticks to like hold up during their protests because the tradition of the Nidstag, the stake of scorn, is apparently alive and well, at least in a kind of like watered down uh, uh, modern version. And I was just like, you know, I love the fact that that is still a thing people will do. How do we express disapproval? We stick the head of a fish onto like a pencil or something and go, <laughs> we disapprove of you. Yes, that is fantastic. That's amazing. Um, so we have a few more minutes. If anyone has any more questions, please put them in. Uh, the Q and A, and also they can be about other things than the Norse retellings too. Um, uh, any other books or anything about fiction in general, or uh, yes, recommendations or, from you guys are very welcome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, please do um, share anything that. Yeah, recommendations are fantastic. Um, do you want to talk about uh, anything else that you have going on or other work in the works? Um, I the I think the main thing would be. Um, so the, the Waking of Onion Terror, at the moment you have to order it from the UK, it will be coming out in the US next month. So if the shipping costs from the UK are prohibitive for you, which is understandable because dear God, the amount of money it costs to ship a book overseas these days is absurd. Um, it will be out in the US. There will be both an ebook and a print edition, uh, but those are lagging behind. And there's also going to be an audio book, though I don't know when that's going to be released. Podium is working on it right now. I'm not sure when it's going to be out. Um, and, uh, yeah, just kind of fair warning that, uh, if you've read my other work, this one is bloodier and darker than a lot of it. So like, don't, don't expect the memoirs of Lady Trent from it is what I'm saying. It's going to be a bit of a harder road for my characters. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'm, I don't have anything out coming out after this for a little bit. Uh, it's been a busy little while. I have my, my book, The Chatelaine, came out uh, at the same time as The Valkyrie a few months ago, which is a, um, a revised version of my 2018 debut novel, which previously was titled Armed in Her Fashion. And it's uh, weird medieval 14th century Flanders. Uh, and that's my dark, darkest book, yeah. uh, I think. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to say, I understand why they retitled it, but I loved the title "Armed in Her Fashion." I thought that yeah, was me too. Title. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, too. It's it's one of those titles that uh, you know, it's a line from the middle of the book somewhere, and and those I love those titles when it's like you, yeah. you reach the line, you know, and you're like, ah, oh, there's the title. <laughs> so, yeah, but now it's called the Chatelaine, um, and uh, yeah, so Harper Voyager put out a, a revised edition because the original version came out uh, with a small press and was out of print for a while. Um, and uh, the embroidered book came out last year, which is a big uh, historical fantasy about Marie Antoinette and quite a different thing altogether from the Valkyrie, um, which is shorter and more poetic, I think. And uh, yeah, obviously yeah. a different setting. Yeah. So, you you know, say different thing altogether. And yet I could see similarities because it's mm -hmm. like the alternation between your two main female characters who have you know, a different yeah. sort of close relationship because that one's sisters instead. Mm -hmm. um, but then also just like the interest in digging into history and in particular like Marie Antoinette is a more well-known corner of history but her sister off in Naples is much less so I think for at least Americans um or maybe Canadians as well uh, yeah. Yeah. so I, I was still seeing some connections there and in, in, I'm like ah yes this is a Kate book <laughs> yeah definitely yeah yeah sort of women in history and uh questions about power and that kind of thing seem to come up a lot um yeah with me and the one I'm working on now I'm just doing structural edits on a novel set in World War II which is also about sisters. So yeah, more, <laughs> more alternating uh, female protagonists. Um, so yeah, but it's bouncing around to a, to a different era again, but that one's, like I say, it's still an edit. So it'll be another year or so before that one comes out. Um, so a nice little bit of a break for a while. We'll see. I, a yeah. break <laughs> as I work curiously behind the scenes, but it looks like a break from the outside. A break for everybody else, not for us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Time to yeah, catch up. Yeah, exactly. is what everybody else thinks nothing is going on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly for sure yeah um, um yeah and i don't see it. last last call for questions i think and is there anything yeah. else on our list of topics that we didn't get to uh i mean there are things but are we going to fit them into the time that we have um uh let's see 
Oh, just the, uh, you know, because we both have kind of witchcraft related things in there. That was something else that I changed when I did the revisions. When I originally wrote the book, the magic in it I referred to as Sather, uh, which is a, a real like Norse magic um, that, you know, you, you can find references to in history and in the, the sagas and so forth. And at the time that I wrote the book, like it had come up in passing in one of my classes. And I was like, that sounds cool. And so I put it into the book, knowing nothing about it beyond the name, basically. And then years later, I come back and look at it, having learned some stuff about Sather in the meantime, and went, that is not even remotely Sather, that mm -hmm. I'm going to make up a new word here because I've made up my own type of magic. I should not pretend it's something out of history. So, mm -hmm. yep, there, there were things that, uh, you know, just post-college me thought were a great idea that later me went, maybe not <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah the magic magic and witchcraft was an interesting challenge i think for me too you know as a fantasy writer i mean obviously that's one of the things that that i wanted to dig into and use as a tool in the mm -hmm. in the plot but um there were sort of two different strands of magic that show up in the stories and one of them is uh the rune lore which i think yeah. is you know probably very easily misunderstood um mm -hmm. you know it, it's you know it can, it can be kind of oversimplified and and um you know so what i did with it is i tried as much as possible to just look at the actual sources that talk about brunhild to valkyrie and like she there's a poem a lovely poem where it's brunhild telling sigurd all about the runes and what they do and so i just use that as kind of a springboard for their actual relationship and talking about the runes and what they do and um yeah. you know i always going back to the original sources for me is uh most fun and uh, feels safest because you know there's so many books out there about runes and rune magic and there's this accretion of centuries of um, yeah you know scholarship and a lot of a lot of woo you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> of various kinds yeah the, the um, so rune that was stuff. one and then oh no go ahead yeah I, the, runes are another thing that I added in during revisions because I actually hadn't brought them up at all in the original draft and then in between the original draft and the revision I'd read a book that was about okay what do we know about historic Icelandic magic and it was all about rune staves I'm like well how do I not have rune staves in this book clearly I must fix that yeah 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 it's, it's clearly very important and it's come down to yeah. us you know so I think that's that's really crucial um, yeah. and then the other thing in the stories is that sometimes there would just be sort of unexplained magic you know like there is at least one witch in some of the versions of the stories several yeah. witches and, and others and um and they would just be able to do things like make someone invisible or you know have this magic beer that made people forget things uh, but there is not a lot of what we would call in modern fantasy a magic system which it's just there i i have gotten increasingly allergic to the phrase magic system Mm -hmm. Because I think it leads to a certain mentality that, like, it, it's not that that can't be a fun game to play, but when you look at history and historical beliefs about magic, they often don't look like a magic system. Like, the, the mm -hmm. book on Icelandic magic that I was reading talked about how um, there is no pattern that you can find in the documents for particular substances or any, like, you know, those kind of, like, correspondences that we think of as being important. It's like, no, mainly it was just intent. And like, you could draw these runes while calling on Odin or, you know, the Christian God or a demon or whatever, you know, it's fine. Like mm -hmm. a lot of real magical beliefs were much more grab bag and, and not based on like an underlying framework that could be clearly explicated, uh, mm -hmm. which leads folklorists to, you know, spend their time writing papers about what the non-obvious underlying logic might've been. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it definitely, it feels a lot more, you know, it has that strangeness to it and it has that, um, sense of an unseen world which i think yeah. can be sometimes a little bit lost when we, we say okay well these are the rules and as long yeah. as you do this everything will be fine um right i mean it everything has to feel place, too much like but... science yeah yeah you know. exactly yeah i think so especially when you are writing a story that is grounded in these traditions then i think it's nice to have that sort of more uh more numinous approach yeah um so i think i see we only got a few minutes uh, so i think the only other thing that i wanted to say uh before i forget is that uh to say that uh, to thank Brookline Booksmith, Booksmith obviously, and yes. uh, to say that if um, you can buy the Valkyrie from Brookline Booksmith, uh, they have some book plates. I just said the syllable book a lot of times. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> so sign book plates for me. Um, and it's always nice to support uh, the host uh, bookstore. So if you want to yes. buy the book anyway, please do buy it from them. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, absolutely buy The Waking of Angantyr, which I have read and adored and is lovely. And I always want to call it The Wreckage of Agathon because uh, that is a John Gardner book that has the same 
you know, sort of basic cadence. Yeah, it's yeah. Also a fantastic book. <laughs> uh, anything you wanted to say before we wrap up? Uh, no, you beat me to thanking our hosts, but I can thank them too. Um, I especially appreciate you guys being willing to have me do this event when I can't have you selling my book directly. Um, I'm sorry for the timing on that. I want to thank you both for being here. Y'all are absolutely incredible. We are, I mean, we love both of the books, which is why we're so happy to, you know, host an event such as this. I did post the links in the chat for everybody if you uh, are interested in purchasing either. Uh, if you are buying through us, we have until noon tomorrow to make like guarantee that you're going to get this signed book plate uh, for the Valkyrie. So that's definitely, you know, something to keep in mind. And yeah, I hope everyone has a great rest of your night. Thank you seriously again for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evenings and thank you participants for watching and I will, you know, hopefully see y'all again soon.